challenging hymn and perhaps a challenging chapter for us this evening when we consider the, uh, or continue to consider the detailed review of the judgments of God on the apostate religious power of Rome. Uh, And really what we're looking at this evening is an expansion of the summary statement that we find in, in Revelation 14 and verse 8, which is In fact, the first mention of Babylon in the book of Revelation, where the apostle saw and said, there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, to begin with, what we perhaps want to do is to is to recap, perhaps a little, on the last couple of studies and explore, really, for our own benefit, the identity of this Babylon that is described in our chapter. Because I think it's useful for us to to stop and consider, and not just um, take for granted these things. If If we think of the Old Testament references to the nation or to the city of Babylon... The references in the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, always refer to what we know as the historical nation and empire of Babylon, with roots which stem right back to the early days of Genesis, to the establishment of of Babel, when that was established in rebellion to the commands of the Lord God himself to spread out and to fill this newly refreshed world. And historically, of course, it it became that truly great first empire in relation to the purpose of God with his chosen people of Israel. And it was under Nebuchadnezzar that this empire was identified as the head, the head of the kingdom of men, that head of gold depicted in the image in Daniel chapter 2, and the first lion-like creature with the heart of a man in in Daniel chapter 7. But when we come to the New Testament, beside some historical references to that empire, the name appears to be only used once outside the the book of Revelation, and in that sense, used in a figurative sense. If we go back to um, the first epistle of Peter, (coughs) chapter 5. And it's right at the end of the epistle as the apostle writes his final salutation. Verse 13 of chapter 5, he says, The ecclesia that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. And it seems that this was probably either the ecclesia in Jerusalem or even in Rome. We cannot be 100% sure of that, I don't believe, from, from the evidence of Scripture itself. But what we do know very clearly is that this was not the site of ancient Babylon, uh, what we know as ancient Babylon in in modern-day Iraq. That city, Babylon, had no ecclesia. It did not exist in the first century when the Apostle Peter wrote those words. And when we come to the book of Revelation, in chapters 14 through 18, the prophet then speaks of the fall of Babylon, the city of Babylon, in the context of events that surround the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom. And once again, we repeat, and it's very important for us to understand this, I I suppose, that this is not, therefore, cannot be, the historical Babylon that we read of in the Old Testament. Because that was destroyed in accordance with the prophecy of Scripture. Can we just turn back... Um, to the prophet Jeremiah, please, in the 51st chapter. Jeremiah 51, and verse 36 to start with. We read, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will plead thy cause and take vengeance for thee. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, 
an astonishment and an hissing without an inhabitant. And that was a literal judgment to be passed upon the city of and the nation of Babylon. And again at verse 60 of the same chapter, we go down there. We're told that Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon. Even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, When thou comest to Babylon and shalt see, and shalt read all these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place, to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate for ever. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, thou shalt bind a stone to it, cast it into the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. And so given that the scripture cannot be contradicted, the Babylon in Revelation very clearly cannot be a re-establishment of that great historical um, empire and the physical location of, of Babylon in, in Iraq. And in recent history, or fairly recent history, Saddam Hussein was defeated as he tried to defy this prophecy, whether wittingly or not. Um, and, and one commentator wrote about his developments. He said, in 1983, Saddam Hussein, imagining himself as an heir to Nebuchadnezzar, ordered the rebuilding of Babylon. And like Nebuchadnezzar, he had his name inscribed on the bricks which were placed directly on top of the ruins, some 2,500 years old. A sample inscription said, in the, region, in the reign sorry, of victorious Saddam Hussein, the President of the Republic, may God keep him, the guardian of the great Iraq and the renovator of its renaissance and the builder of its great civilization, the rebuilding of the great city of Babylon was done in 1987. Well, there was a man of pride, wasn't it? But Hussein put huge portraits of himself and of Nebuchadnezzar up at that site. Um, but during the Gulf War... Um, much of this work was overthrown and destroyed by the military camps of the US-led alliance. And having said that, though, there are some who will hold end-time views of the literal and futuristic interpretation of the book of Revelation that will expect Babylon to be rebuilt in the location of its ancient site and to become a work centre so that Revelation 18 can be fulfilled. And, and it's important that we understand that because of the contradiction of that view with the prophecy that we saw in Jeremiah, it, it's another reason for us, brothers and sisters, why we should hold to a traditional continuous historic interpretation of this book. Because it, to, do, to take a, a futuristic view of this destruction of Babylon on the literal site of ancient Babylon would be to contradict the word of God himself, who said that Babylon would, be, would sink and would not rise from the evil that the Lord would bring upon her. So, having said that, and I think it was an important foundation to lay, what, who or what does Babylon then represent in the prophecy that we're considering this evening? Uh, let's go to the scriptural references themselves for a moment and see what they say. In, in Revelation 14, verse 8, Babylon, we're told, made all the nations drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 16, verse 19, says, The great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So it's described there as great Babylon. And then in chapter 17 and verse 5, we see there that Babylon the Great is the seat of the power of the whore who is linked to all false doctrine and opposed to and significantly persecuting the true saints of God. So that's what scripture tells us here in, in Revelation. And so what's described for us is a power which has dominated the religious world, a world that emanated from the Roman Empire, the, the legs of the 
image of Daniel 2 and the terrible beast of Daniel 7 that's expounded in, in Revelation 13 as emerging from the sea, from the sea of nations. And what's described is a, a religious power that was once political. Just, can we keep our, our fingers there for a minute? Go back to Daniel 7. Just remind ourselves what we were told there in, in Daniel 7. Daniel 7 and verse 23. Talking of this great and dreadful beast, verse 23 of Daniel 7. Thus, he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them. He shall be diverse from the first and shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. Now, when we look at the historical record and and the the system that developed out of this pagan Roman Empire and the rulers of John's day, uh, and in fulfilment of the prophetic words of the Apostle Paul, we begin to identify what is represented by this, this power. Um, just come forward, if you would, Second Thessalonians. Very familiar words to us, Second Thessalonians 3. I think I mean First Thessalonians 3, or even 2, sorry. Um, first Thess- Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Where the apostle says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And so it goes on to say that the mystery of iniquity was already at work amongst the ecclesia. But the power that would let it, the pagan power, would be removed, and then that wicked one would be revealed. And this, we understand, is the development of the apostate system of religion, so-called Christianity, which, as we see at the end of this section in verse 8, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So that, that system, we're told, would develop and would be revealed and would be in existence until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would consume it and destroy it with the brightness of his coming. And that that's the... The section that we're considering in the prophecy of um, the Lord Jesus Christ here in Revelation. And and as you saw last week in Revelation 17, the apostate religious system of Rome that described as the great whore is is that which is described for us here in the the judgments. And we we would suggest, therefore, if you look at verse 17 of chapter 17... Or oh, verse 18, the woman, representative of the power of this apostate religion in Rome and all the associated Christian religions, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And so the great city, the city of Babylon here in Revelation, is equated to the woman in Revelation 17. It's synonymous with the city of Rome, where the centre of false Christian worship flourished and has remained to this day. And that city, the literal city of Rome, and specifically we would think the Vatican States, is the focus, we believe, of the judgment here that's declared in Revelation 18. 
And just as ancient Babylon was destroyed and completely removed from the earth to take away its false worship and its deity-defying power base from the ancient world, so too the seat of the Romish apostate church will be removed from the earth in the kingdom to blot out the seat of false religion and everything that's associated with that um, around the world. Uh, And brothers and sisters, it will be the saints of Christ who perform this act of judgment whilst the nations of the world look on in incredulity and horror. So what does this 18th chapter then tell us of this time of judgment, these momentous events which are to come upon the earth? Well, verse 1 of, of chapter 18. John says, After these things I saw... And another angel come down from, uh, saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And after these things, that that phrase at the beginning shows that this chapter indeed follows on from that described in chapter 17, verse 16 through 18. Where the ten horns of the beast hated the whore uh, and... Eventually, um, that great city was prepared for judgment. And the angel here is shown as descending to announce the final phase in the removing of Romish apostasy and the seat of its power. As the Lamb, verse 17, verse 14, shall overcome and become Lord of Lords and King of Kings with those that are with him. So, He descends. And this is, of course, consistent, isn't it, with the prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ's return, when he's prophesied to return of in power and great glory to judge this world. Again, Thessalonians, the apostle says, You who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. And from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. And to be admired in all them that believe. Because our testimony was believed among you in that day. And this is a pictorial fulfillment of that prophecy of the apostle as he wrote to the Thessalonians. Now, in in his exposition in Eureka, Brother Thomas renders that phrase, I saw an angel descending, which picks up a, a present participle tense and shows that the coming of Christ in this is, is a process. It's a process, yes, that begins with his return to the earth, but it encompasses surely the judgment and the glorification of the saint community They're gathering into one power and then coming from Teman with the judgments of God and eventually the establishment of the New Jerusalem community and authority upon the hill of Zion. And this is part of that process, this descending process of coming in judgment. And this glory of the saints then, this now immortalized community of saints with Christ coming to exercise this judgment is said in verse 1 to illuminate the earth. That is the, the way in which the glory of God will be revealed to the nations of the world. Uh, and we see that, therefore, the, the judgments that are described are indeed necessary to fulfill the promise written that eventually the whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord himself. Removing Babylon, removing that which represents the seat of apostate rebellious religion from the peoples of the earth is a necessary prerequisite 
to the ultimate state of peace and righteousness that will be in the earth. And when the angel comes and cries here in Revelation, in verse 4, he said, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So this call then gives warning to those in the environs of that great Babylon. And we suggest those physically in Rome to flee the judgment at this time. This is akin to to Lot's commandment from the angel to flee from the destruction which was to ensue in Sodom rather than to be engulfed in that time. And given that we've just said that the saints are here in glory with Christ to execute this judgment, we conclude that those described here as the my people must be another group. There are obvious spiritual lessons for us in our day and age that we should not be associated with these false religious practices. But at this specific time, it would appear this group of my people is is another people. And so we ask the question, well, where do we find this phrase then, my people, in the prophetic writings, and who does it refer to? Well, just a couple of examples, I think, show that it relates to the natural seed of Israel. Um, Descendants of Abraham. Can we go to Jeremiah again? Jeremiah 24, please. (coughs) Jeremiah 24 and verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And, and if we go over to Ezekiel 39, again, for another, another reference... There are many such. Um, Verse 6 of Ezekiel 39. I will send a fire, says the Lord, upon Magog and upon them, among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And so we, we see that this call then goes out to those that are in the environs of this city, the physical location of the people of Israel to remove themselves from the impending judgments. And without those that respond in Israel out of the area, the judgments will begin. Verses 6 to 8 of Revelation 18 show the extent of the corruption and the evil that has resulted in the wrath of the Father being expressed in this way. For that pride and the evil that is shown by this system and all that it represents, the cup of the wrath of God referenced in Revelation 16 and verse 19 Um, which talks of the the cup of the wine of the fierceness of God's wrath, was to be doubled to the nation. This doubling, um, verse 6, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled to her double. Uh, And this seems to reference back to the law, doesn't it? That the thief under the law, had to recompense for his trespass double that which he had taken. Babylon the Great, that great system, has trespassed greatly in taking the glory of God to itself. It has persecuted and it has taken the life and the blood of the saints of God over the ages. And it's attributed God's power to demons. In pride and in arrogance, that city and her husband... The pontiffs of all ages have said, 
quoted here, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Rome itself has been described as the eternal city. In fact, if you just need to Google Rome, you'll see that it's referred to, or Google the eternal city, comes up and it says that's Rome. It speaks of itself as an eternal city. Yet the Father declares here, he will bring it to ruin. It will see sorrow, and it will be destroyed in one day. Uh, And the apocalyptic reference here then shows that the destruction of ancient Babylon was also typical of the latter-day destruction of this power and this city. Look at a couple of verses again in, in Jeremiah. Here we see reference to the speed of the judgment that came upon ancient Babylon. Interestingly, there's a reference also to a year, uh, which on a day for a year principle may, may well be the day referenced in, in Revelation chapter 18. Let's just go back to Jeremiah, if we would, for a minute, to chapter 50. Jeremiah 50 and verse 31. The Lord declares, Behold, of Babylon, behold, I am against thee, O thou most most proud, saith the Lord God of hosts, for thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee. And remember, this is about ancient Babylon. Thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee. Go to the next chapter, 51, verse 8. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain, if so, she may be healed. And so she is suddenly fallen and destroyed. And then verse 45, we read, My people, another reference to my people coming out of the city of Babylon, literally here, Go ye out of the midst of her, and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord, and lest your heart faint, and ye fear for the rumour that shall be heard in the land. A rumour shall both come one year, and after that in another year shall come a rumour, and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. And there's a reference to the one year and another year. This sudden destruction and the judgment is described in verse 8 of of Revelation 18 of this future um, city of Babylon, the great Babylon. It says, the her plague shall come in one day, death, mourning and famine, she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. She is to be utterly burned with fire, says the prophet. And fire, of course, is associated with the judgments of God in Scripture. And to be utterly burned means to a total and a final destruction in judgment. And there's another reference to the fact that this city, this system, will be completely removed from the earth so that there is no vestige of a, a remnant in the kingdom age. And we see this is... Literally, in the count, of, again, of this overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. And the language is, is used here and is picked up again in, in chapter 19, um, verse 20. Revelation 19, verse 20. Where we're told that the beast was taken, with him the false prophet, and they uh, worshipped his image. These both, at the end of the verse, were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone here the beast and the false prophet are cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and this lake of fire the arena of the judgments of the almighty is centered we see here upon the apostate christian nations of europe which have been perpetually under the direct influence of the papacy and the apostate system of christianity since the time of christ This figure is picked up again in in Revelation 21 uh, and verse 8. It talks there of the judgment. It says, The fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
Uh, and whilst it's not a specific subject this evening, perhaps this indicates that those rejected at the judgment will be sent back into this territory of the judgments, the arena of the judgments of God on Babylon the Great, to be caught up in those fiery judgments of Revelation 18. Now, when we go back to Revelation 18, verse 8, at the end of the verse, we see the reason um, we see the reason that the plagues will come in one day. And that is because strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. The Almighty, with his power vested in his Son and, and the immortalized saints, is strong to bring about these judgments. These judgments will emanate from the eternal spirit and through the manifestation of his power in his Son. Nothing, therefore, brethren and sisters, nothing at all can withhold the ferociousness and finality of these righteous judgments. And righteous they are, that have been determined upon this seat of wickedness. And the saints in Christ, as the manifestation of the Lord himself, will render this system double for all that she has done to the saint community over the, over the years. Now, the speed and the ferocity of the fall of the latter-day Babylonian city will mirror that of the original ancient nation. But it will also astonish the nations. Revelation 18, verses 9 through 19, describe the incredulity that the nations will feel when such a strong and a significant trading partner is destroyed. Notice in verse 9, it speaks of the fact that the kings of the earth have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. And when we read about fornication in the scriptures, brethren and sisters, it usually represents the practices that apostate and false doctrines propagated by idolaters in opposition to the truth. In the literal pagan world, false religion was often associated with immoral practices with the temple prostitutes and the like being the heightened manifestation of earthly and sensual religious practice. And these things tend to corruption, they tend to abasement, and they pervert the purity of the divine order. And here in Revelation, uh, and in in chapter 2, we are directed to two people when the ecclesia is spoken to by Christ, Balaam, and Jezebel, with her prophets of Baal, who each introduced in the ancient nation of Israel fornication amongst the children of Israel in the same way that the apostates in the first century mixed these practices with a show of Christ worship. And we see references to this in the letters of Paul to to Corinth, to Galatia, to Ephesus, and to Colossae. But brothers and sisters... Surely we see it today in the apostate religion of this age. A religion which is styled uh, humanism, but has become enshrined in so-called Christianity, which allows freedom to practice perversion of the divine order of both gender and monogamous relationships. The apostate religious church has embraced this doctrine of inclusion that is roundly um, condemned here by the Lord through his prophet. And they'll do that to their eventual destruction. And it's a severe warning to us, isn't it, to all who would name the name of Christ. Those who are astonished by this destruction of the seat of the false prophet will not only be the profane kings and rulers of the nations, but surely will also include some who have traded in the apostate wares of this religion those who practice it in other nations. We're sure that there will be, perhaps, many church leaders and so-called reverends of this world who will have their authority and means means taken forcibly from the midst of the earth, who are left in the outlying lands in isolation to await their reward at the hands of Christ and the saints. Because he will rule the nations with a rod of iron and he will remove all that offends. Now, the trade of this city is described for us in in this section, uh, in verses 12 and 13. And all these commodities 
we are sure have passed through the hands of the literal Holy Roman Empire and its enclaves over the centuries. The system has held sway over the trade and economy of all its territory in prior years up until the demise of its temporal power. But the current day uh, papal state, the Vatican City and the ventures of the Holy See, as, as it is called, are still significant in financial terms, but especially, of course, in spiritual terms, as it still trades heavily in the souls of men, which is that final phrase in verse 13. A note to the array of clothing that's mentioned for us here in verse 16 and see how it equates to that divinely appointed materials of the tabernacle uh, and the temple. J- just listen to a few words from Exodus. Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, and you shall, you shall take my offering. This is the offering which you shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shit in wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. There were the things of the true religion of Christ and of, of the Lord that were there in the, enshrined in the tabernacle. But what's been apostatized and paraded in all the churches of the Catholic harlot and her daughters. Verse um, 16, saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple, scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And we see how there is a danger because the true, very slightly changed, becomes the false. All these things have a have a basis in truth, but have been distorted by those the thinking of men over the centuries. So we see then the, the wares that are, are to be judged and that will be wailed. And the force with which this judgment comes, verse um, 20, um, upon Babylon the Great is shown, it's actually verse 21, A mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, cast it into the sea, saying, Thus, with violence, shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. This is a very decisive, isn't it, and and, and violent act of utter removal of this once humanly great city. It it, it ties back to that which we read in Jeremiah, was not it, of natural Babylon where the prophecy was tied to a stone and thrown into the river Euphrates. Here the angel took up a great stone like a millstone and cast it into the sea. And it says it will be found no more at all. And the figure of this millstone, we think, is a fulfilment of a prophecy that the Lord Jesus Christ made. And it's a confirmation of the way in which this system has offended many little ones over the centuries. And your mind may be there. It's in Luke 17, um, verse 1. Where the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, It is impossible but that offences will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. And we think there's a great play on, on this word of the Lord Jesus Christ that comes out here in the prophecy where the, the final judgment of this state, which has offended many, will represent that, that great millstone being thrown into the sea. The finality and completeness of its removal from the earth it is emphasized by the following verses, and it's one of those sets of verses which quite often can be quite difficult to read, particularly in public, can't it? Because of the repetition that the sound, for example, shall be heard no more at all in thee, and it keeps going through. And the emphasis is on, on a finality. These things will not be heard any more at all in that city, for the city 
will not be there. There will be nothing left, this tells us, during the millennial reign of Christ and the saints for the nations to hanker after. And surely, whilst we may struggle to contemplate, really, the the destruction involved and the, the magnitude of these judgments, we can see the wisdom and the justice in the Almighty's declared intent. Verse 23 continues, The light, sorry, towards the end, For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by... Thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And when we think about that, that is quite a claim, isn't it? It's quite a statement for the Lord to make. In her was found the blood of prophets, of saints, and all that were slain on the earth. No wonder the Almighty has reserved this terrible judgment for them. And towards the end of this chapter, at verse 20, the saints are told to rejoice. To rejoice over the outpouring of this judgment. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And there's a, an important point for us here, brothers and sisters, It's not for us, is it, to reap vengeance or to rejoice now. For as the Apostle Paul wrote, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And we read in in Deuteronomy, to me, says the Lord, belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that shall come upon them make haste. And it's a very important point that we should remember as we consider the judgments of God. That vengeance alone belongs to God himself. It is to Yahweh. And in the prophetic writings of Isaiah in both chapters 34 and 63. We see that this is reserved. This vengeance is reserved for the time of the kingdom. Perhaps we can go to Isaiah 34 and verse 8. Isaiah 34 speaks again of the the coming of the kingdom and the judgments of God. And at verse 8, it declares, It is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And so the, the the day of the Lord's vengeance is related to the controversy of Zion and the recompense of it. And again, if we go to um, chapter 63... Uh, and verse 4 of Isaiah. Isaiah 63, verse 4. Again, here is a, a picture of the coming of Christ in judgment. And at verse 4, we read, For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And so the rejoicing that is referred to in, in, in Revelation 18 is not solely over destruction. But it's that the promised time of glory and of restoration spoken of by all the prophets is finally there. The time of judgment, as prophesied in in Psalm 149, has come, where the psalmist speaks of the saints and says, to execute upon them, the nations, the people, their kings and nobles, the judgments written, this honour hath all his saints. Praise God. Yahweh. And so, so it is that the, the judgments and the rejoicing of the saints at this time is that the time of the kingdom is here. And this work that we've been considering in the last couple of weeks is one of necessity and it's one of cleansing the earth to prepare it for the new growth of the kingdom. And so we conclude our remarks, which shows the end of one of the major elements of the kingdom of men, that styled Great Babylon. And brothers and sisters, we should not gloat over the impending doom of this evil system, but we should look for the time 
which will ensue when these judgments are passed, when there is peace and righteousness amongst the nations of the world. And for our part, we should be very warned, shouldn't we? We should be severely warned of the insidious evil of the philosophies of man, the systems to be judged propagate. We need to hold fast, as the, as the Lord Jesus Christ says, to that which we have. If we are to have hope of being amongst those who will have the honour to work thus with Christ in the perfection of immortality. And so in the words of the Master, we'll, we'll finish our class now. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast that thou hast, that no man take thy crown.